Hello, everyone. I'm Gustavo Tolosa, your plant-based chef and also coach. And welcome to today's session. I think today is number five. Well, today we will continue with our book, The Healthiest Diet on the Planet by Dr. John McDougall. And um, today has been a busy day because I started with a YouTube live where I showed how I was eating the wonderful gnocchi that I taught you how to make in my first episode of The Pianist and Chef. And then I played an introduction. I played the piano for the conference, Food as Medicine. And now I'm with you here. So very good. Someone um, uh, sent me a question last week. And um, because you can also type questions in my YouTube channel. And this person, I wanted to address because this is a question that comes up very often. And it says, the question that this person has is, how many grams of protein are you consuming daily? This person is asking me. I used to aim for 50 grams daily, consuming lots of soy, tempeh, etc. But now I am probably only on about 20 grams. I feel great. Plenty of energy, yet falling way below what many say is required. So I want to address that. I know that we have covered this in our previous book club in the Starch Solution. In my YouTube channel, there is a playlist, and you can find all of our sessions there. And there is a session about protein. And then... Uh, I think two weeks ago, we talked about protein here, protein here. So, um, but I still want to address this question because on page 19 of the book, uh, Dr. McDougall says the truth about protein. And um, this is probably one of the biggest hoax um, or the, you know, uh, I was going to say jokes, but it's not a joke really, that the um, industry has played on us because as Dr. McDougall says, any natural diet, as long as it contains a sufficient amount of calories will always, and then he says, I repeat, always fulfill your body's need for protein. So there is the answer. Do I count protein when I eat? No, I don't count it. Maybe I would count it if I was an athlete or training for, um, you know, some, some major event. Uh, but otherwise, if I eat enough proteins, and, and sorry, if I eat enough calories and those calories are coming from uh, the foods that Dr. McDougall and any other doctor that is plant-based mm, recommends, then you are covered. You don't have to worry about protein. So Dr. McDougall goes on and says, there has never been a single case of protein deficiency reported in the world. So you don't have to worry about it. Just enjoy life, enjoy your food. Don't worry about protein. There's never been a case reported in the world that result, resulted from any natural diet with a sufficient number of calories. Um, so it says here, meanwhile, billions of people are suffering and dying because they're eating too much protein. And then he goes on to talk about the respected researchers find that those hunter-gatherer populations that have based their diets on meat, such as the uh, Inuits, Eskimos, suffer from heart disease and other forms of atherosclerosis, while hunter-gatherers who have based 
their diets on plant foods, starches, are free of these diseases. Also, epidemic among the meat and fish consuming hunter-gatherers, like the Eskimos, is osteoporosis. Eating excess high protein, animal-derived foods, in addition, contributes to our most common diseases for many well-established reasons, including the indisputable facts that they are high in cholesterol, most are high in fat, and they contain no dietary fiber or digestible carbohydrates. They're also filthy with disease causing microbes, etc. Protein, it says here on page 20, accelerates growth for good and bad. Meat and dairy products stimulate growth by various mechanisms, and then he goes on to explain the IGF-1, um, and that's not a good thing. And so uh, what I want to show you is a chart that I think I've showed you before, but it's always good to see things more than once. So um, I just wanted to show you how there is protein in just about everything. So if you eat a varied diet and you eat nuts and seeds and beans and um, uh, all the uh, starch um, vegetables and non-starchy vegetables and fruits and everything has protein. So by the end of the day, you have enough protein. And um, Dr. McDougall talks about the levels of protein uh, that are acceptable. And, you know, even 20 grams is acceptable. So go back to the Start Solution book, and he talks more in detail about the recommendations of protein. Most Americans and most uh, meat-eating, uh, you know, cultures uh, consume way above uh, the safe levels of protein. So look at all these nuts and seeds. They have quite a lot of um, grams of protein. Uh, you know, we don't usually think of, say, spinach or um, asparagus or broccoli or artichokes or Brussels sprouts as being foods that contain protein, but they do, and they contain a good... Uh, amount. Look at this. Uh, you can get a lot of protein, basically all the protein you need in a day with one cup, with 100 grams of beans, and you don't have to consume uh, all, you know, the other negative elements that you have in beef. And uh, you also have protein in mushrooms and cauliflower and cabbage. And so here we have more. So I hope that um, I answered the question. I think, uh, you know, also another doctor that talks extensively about protein is Dr. Campbell. And you might want to research his name on the web because of his research, the connection between protein and cancer. Um, and really the levels of protein that we need a day are uh, way lower than what uh, the industry have you know, made us believe. Then there is a book uh, that is called Protein Hot protein uh, uh, holic and uh, that's a great book because we have pretty much become obsessed about protein when it really should be no issue. Okay, so today we're going to finish chapter three, which is really the main, uh, the only chapter that we have left. And that page that I'm going to is page 65. And today we will discuss in uh, some detail the paleo diet. Let's see. 
um, if there are any questions here. Make, you know, any questions or comments that you have are welcome. At the end of this webinar, I'm going to play a little bit of music for you, so stick around. And, um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the next um, episode of the pianist and the chef that is coming in September. And um, okay, let's move on. The paleo diet is also known as the uh, Paleolithic, the Paleo diet, the cave cement diet, the Stone Age diet, and the hunter gatherer diet. And uh, it's a widely popular approach to weight loss, improved health, and longevity. The diet consists mainly of meat, poultry, shellfish, fish, uh, and eggs. Non-starchy orange, green, and yellow vegetables, and fruits and nuts. This approach forbids starches, including all grains, legumes, and potatoes. To its credit, it also excludes dairy products and refined sugars. Salt and processed oils are also excluded, with the exception of olive oil. Um, so it says here on page 67, this nutritional plant is based on the presumption that our ancestors living during the Paleo Paleolithic era between 2.5 million and 10,000 years ago were nourished primarily by animal foods. According to the basic theory behind paleo, as a result of more than 2 million years of evolution, we are now genetically adapted to eat what the hunter-gatherers ate, mostly animal foods. The paleo diet, which was revised in 2011, is the Bible for followers of this approach, written by Lauren Cordain, PhD a professor in the Department of Health and Exercise at Colorado State University. The paleo diet is said to be the one and only diet that ideally fits our genetic makeup. The author claims that every human being on Earth ate this way for the past 2.5 million years until the dawn of the agricultural revolution. I'm going to page 68 to the third um, paragraph where it says primates, including humans, have practiced hunting and gathering for millions of years. I know of no large population of primates who have been strict vegans. And you know, that is I appreciate that Dr. McDougall said that because many times when you hear doctors and, and some nutritionists and chefs and in, in, in some of the uh, lectures and, and conventions, sometimes it just gives you the idea that this is how uh, veganism is how we've always eaten for, for eons. And I think that, you know, that's, it's good. Dr. McDougall is acknowledging that he knows of no large populations that, that were strictly vegans. However, plants have, with very few exceptions, provided the bulk of the calories for almost all primates. When asked about the commonly held idea that ancient people were primarily meat eaters, the highly respected anthropologist Nathaniel Domini PhD from Dartmouth, Dartmouth College, responded, that's a myth. Hunter-gatherers, the majority of their calories come from plant foods. Meat is just too unpredictable. And I like that. I like the, that one, two, three, four, five words. Meat is too unpredictable or was too unpredictable. Nowadays, we can walk into a little you know, supermarket or a big supermarket and there is a meat, but in the paleo 
days, you have to go out <laughs> and find the animal. And then you had to were successful at killing it. And then you had to carry it. And then you had to, you know, take it apart or whatever. And then you had to cook it. And there were no refrigerators. So how, am I, how you know, how, how are you going to um, keep that? You know, everything around that is so unpredictable and it doesn't make sense unless I'm thinking with the, the brain of today's people, you know, our, our world where, you know, I have a refrigerator at home and I can drive it right here and, and buy meat every day, all day long if I want to, but that's not how it was. <laughs> um, after studying the bones, teeth, and genetics of primates for his entire career as a biological anthropologist, Dr. Dominic states, humans might be more appropriately described as starchivores. Paleo diet proponents spare no effort to ignore and distort science. The general public is at their mercy until they look at recent publications from the major scientific journals. And then he has two very important boxes here on page 66 and 67, where you have research done by uh, the journal uh, Nature. Then you have uh, and the issue, the, the journal Science. Uh, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the proceedings, uh, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, several years, the 2010, 2013, 2015. Um, and it's just, uh, that is the research. Uh, that they are ignoring or in some cases distorting. The September 2015 of the Quarterly Review of Biology contained a very thoroughly review of the importance of dietary carbohydrate in human evolution. Um, so even this, even the article's abstract confirms the science behind the healthiest diet on the planet and refutes popular diet books that claim the opposite. And on page 70, uh, Dr. McDougall talks about a repulsive diet. And um, again, I just want to stress that my point of view, my humble point of view, is that um, it's common sense to me that 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 meat uh, could not, you know, could, could not provide uh, the sole source of calories and nutrition during those times. It just, maybe today it could, but uh, I mean, I don't think so, but but maybe, but certainly those in, not in those times, it was unpredictable. The amount you never knew how many, how much you were going to, you know, kill that day, maybe a, a day or two or three or a week would go by and you could not catch an animal. Um, then, you know, you had to be able to to store it to to so that it wouldn't rot. Um, it just uh, you know th there weren't any any farms <laughs> that, during that time. So everything in this comparison that that, that the paleo followers talk about it just um, to me it makes no sense because we're comparing people that were living to you know million years ago or thousands of years ago to today and it's it's nothing like that today um dr mcdougall says on page 70 at the at the bottom of the page um in addition no mention is made by paleo experts about the frequent and habitual practices of nutritional cannibalism by hunter-gatherer societies Nutritional cannibalism refers to the consumption of human flesh uh, for its taste or nutritional value. Archaeologists have found bones 
of our ancestors from a million years from a million years ago with defleshing marks and evidence of bone smashing to get at the marrow inside. There are signs that the brains of victims were also eaten and children were not off the menu. And we are supposed to eat the favorite meats of our uncivilized pre-agricultural revolution hunter-gatherer ancestors? In addition to the usual beef and veal, pork, chicken, and fish, a paleo follower is encouraged to eat alligator, bear, kangaroo, deer, rattlesnake, and wild boar. Mail order suppliers for these wild animals are providing, provided in, in his book that we mentioned earlier. Bone marrow and brains of animals were both favorites of pre-civilization hunter-gatherers. For most of us, including the paleo dieters, the thought of eating bone marrow or brains is repulsive. A nutritional nightmare on page 71. By nature, the paleo diet is based on artery clogging saturated fats and cholesterol and bone damaging acidic proteins from animal foods. Respected, the respected researchers find that modern day hunter gatherer populations who base their diets on meat, such as the Inuits, Eskimos, suffer from heart disease and other forms of atherosclerosis. Also epidemic among meat and fish consuming hunter-gatherers, especially um, the Inuits, is osteoporosis. Meanwhile, hunter-gatherers who base their diets on plant foods are free of these diseases. And then, of course, um, I don't know if you know this, but Dr. McDougall in the last uh, three years or so started um, switching his his um, focus. I mean, it's not that, that, that he never talked about nutrition and, anymore, but he really started talking about uh, the ecological disaster that all this means. And we did some webinars that are on my YouTube channel, and you can see that. Um, and here on page 71 at the bottom, he says, livestock have a substantial impact on the world's water, land, and biodiversity resources and contribute significantly to climate change. Animal agriculture produces 18% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions compared with 13.5% percent from all forms of transportation combined. Think about this. Everything, planes, trains, buses, cars, motorcycles, whatever, everything for transportation combined, all of that combined produces 13.5 percent of all the greenhouse gas emissions while animal agri agriculture produces 18%. The report is a conservative estimate of the destruction caused by the very foods that wheat belly, grain brain, and the paleo diet recommend in abundance. And this is at the top of page 72. Calculations by the World Watch Institute find that over 51% of the global warming gases are the result of racing animals. And this is racing animals, not just, you know, to race them. It's just for the only purpose to eat them. In March 2016, an article in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences concluded that the transition toward a plant-based diet could reduce global mortality by as much as 10% and food-related greenhouse gas emissions by as much as 70% and result in economic benefits reaching as high as $31 trillion by the year 2020. 
50. Every person whom paleo gurus convince to follow an animal food-based diet brings us one step closer to the end of the world as we know. And finally, at the bottom of page 72, according to Dr. Cordain, the agricultural revolution changed the world and allowed civilizations, cities, culture, technological and medical achievements, and scientific knowledge to develop. In other words, if people had remained on a diet of mostly animal foods, assuming this was the diet of our ancestors, we would still be living in the Stone Age. Fortunately, the agricultural revolution with the efficient production of grains, legumes, and potatoes, the very foods recommended by the healthiest diet on the planet, allowed us to become civilized. Dr. Cordain finishes the 2011 revision of his national best-selling book, The Paleo Diet, by warning. Without them, starches, like wheat, rice, corn, and potatoes, the world could probably support one-tenth or less of our present population. So, choose 10 close friends and family members. Which nine should die so that the paleo people could have their way? I think that's a very um, good question that Dr. McDougall poses. The healthiest diet on the planet is the better way. In the following pages, I will share a visual guide that makes it very clear what we should eat and what we should avoid. And that is where on page 74, we start chapter four. And we start with the uh, picture book that we went through, I think, two uh, weeks ago. So that's been already covered. And on chapter four, at the beginning, he just has a very short introduction to the, to the picture book. And then he dives into it. And I think that's one of the most brilliant books because it's very concise and with pictures and colorful. And then after that, on page, on chapter five, we have the recipes. And um, what I would like to do for the next two weeks, so two more Saturdays, is um, choose some uh, recipes. Uh, I have made so a lot of those recipes, but there are some that I haven't. So I thought it would be fun for me to, for the next two Saturdays, take questions from you and comments um, and just cook. And I would send you all an email ahead of time telling you which two or three recipes I will be cooking and you could have the ingredients ready if you wanted to and we could have a cooking time together you know you can be cooking in your house I can be cooking here and um, if time allows it I'll try to choose recipes that don't take a long time to prepare to cook then we could even try it you know so uh, I think that would be a good idea to finish this this particular book club to bring everything into context and to make it practical and in the meantime choose another book for our next uh, sessions of, of uh, the book club since i am still in argentina because i cannot travel yet unfortunately i don't have i didn't bring with me a lot of books and so I, I would like to do a book that I have here. And so I know that I have the cheese trap, which I love. And I actually, I read it really fast when it came out. And I would love to read it again. And since cheese is something that is so addictive and difficult for people to give up, I think it would be a good book. But I have to look at my little library here and see what other books I have. Um, and I will also appreciate your ideas, but that might be a, a good one to read. And um, so I'm going to play a 
tango for you today. And before I do that, I'm going to give you a little preview uh, for September for the second episode of The Pianist and the Chef. I plan, this is the plan. I plan on driving down to the city because I'm way up in the mountains to visit my mother, show you the beautiful views of the mountains and the lakes, then show you how I arrived to the city, which is about 2 million people. And I then show you where my mother lives and show you where I grew up. And um, that brings a lot of memories. And then cooking one of our traditional meals. My grandmother, my mother's mother was from Spain, from Valencia. And she made this Valencian rice that is kind of like a, like a paella, but not quite. And it's so delicious. And that recipe, if we do it, you will be getting a recipe that is totally exclusive because it comes from my grandmother and it comes from her mother. And it was passed on from my great grandmother to my grandmother to my mother now to me. And I'm, I'm going to pass it on to you. And I'll show you how to make these little cakes like uh, made with, with pumpkin, torreji, torrejas, they're called. And I'm going to show you how to make a gazpacho soup really fast. And then my mother and I, because she's a pianist too, we would play two Spanish pieces at the piano together and, and a couple of other things. And then I will introduce you to two other ladies that are very important in my life. So anyway, it's, I think it's going to be one of the most fun and full of emotion uh, webinars that I'll do. I'll keep you updated. Now to close, uh, I will play music for you. Please, uh, if you have any questions here, let's see your comments. Um, we did talk about isolated protein in this book earlier and, and in the starch solution. You um, can always go to drmcdougall.com. That's the website of Dr. McDougall. And under search, there is a wonderful mm, section there where you type things like isolated protein. And then it brings up, it brings out uh, all of the videos or the articles that Dr. McDougall wrote um, or, or talked or even webinars that we did together about that topic. Um, so that's it. If you're watching this on YouTube and you haven't subscribed to my channel, I encourage you to subscribe and click the little bell. If you would like to be in my mailing list, you can go to my website, which is plantemus.com. Um, it's also called thepianistandthechef.com. And there's a pop-up window there that uh, where you can... Uh, Put your name and your email, and you'll be in my email list. So once again, thank you for joining me today. Today is a little bit shorter because we're finished. We fin basically finished the book. I will see you all next week. And now if you give me a minute, I will move the camera so that it's closer to the piano, and I will play for you.
Well, I hope that you enjoyed that. That was kind of unrehearsed. Sometimes that's the best way. And um, it came from my heart to your heart. It's a very passionate piece of music. And uh, that's how I feel. And I'm sure you feel about health and uh, helping others. And it's a, it's a passion. So very good. I cannot dance tango, but I can play it. So again, thank you. And uh, I will see you all next week. Goodbye, everyone.